The Nobel Peace Prize for 2014 is to be awarded to Kailash Satyarthi for the struggle against suppression of young people and children. There is no greater violence than to deny the dreams of our children. I refuse to accept that the laws and constitutions are unable to protect our children. Today is the time for every child to have the right to life. I refuse to accept that the shackles of slavery can ever be more stronger than the quest for freedom. I refuse to accept here. Getting a greeting like this is all the reward Kailash Setyarti needs for freeing these children from a life of slavery. He tries to give these kids the childhood they missed. Do you think these kids see you as a Nobel Peace Prize winner? No, oh, I don't think they, they see me as friend or brother or something like father. I have looked into their frightened and exhausted eyes. I've held their injured bodies and I've felt their broken spirits. I refuse to accept that children belonging to certain sections of society are born to work for others at the cost of their childhood and freedom and education. If the children are exploited, if the children are deprived from their childhood in any part of the world, the world cannot live in peace. The world cannot be human. It's not often the two winners of the Nobel Peace Prize get together, but it happened yesterday when President Obama met Kailash Sartiarte. They were joined by three children who were rescued from child trafficking and forced marriage. You cannot live in isolation. All the problems and solutions are interconnected. And so the problem of child labor in any part of the world is your problem. Sartiarte organizes raids with local police sometimes employers are tipped off and waiting for him armed. But I have been attacked many times in my life. You had a gun to your head? Literally, yeah. This is dangerous work for you these kids. Somebody has to pay the cost for freedom. It does not come on plate. So if I, if not me, then who else will do? Come the Nobel Prize. Who won the Nobel Prize, he asks. Their reply? All of us kids. It's good. <laughs> Every single minute matters. Every single child matters. Every single childhood matters. Listening to Ambassador Young was a spiritual experience for me. I have gone deep into the civil rights movement of this country. I was thinking of Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King and just hugging you when I came to this hotel. It felt that I am touching the spirit of Martin Luther King. Thank you, Ambassador Yun. I am also thankful to John and the entire board of Fulbright Association for giving me this great opportunity. And also listening to Mayor Mohammed Reed and Kim and others. In fact, though 
these two big lamps are facing on my head and face. But uh, I could see it. at least 200 enlightened lamps are looking at me and seeing me here. Each one of you is an enlightened lamp. Each one of you is a powerhouse. And one powerhouse can serve the electricity requirement of the entire town sometimes. But when you are sitting in the midst of 200 powerhouses, then I cannot express my feeling. That is my feeling. So thank you for that. Today, it seems that we are celebrating courage. We are celebrating the power of thought, the power of education, the power of peace. Today, we are celebrating the bright minds, their power, and their vision. And of course, I don't, I can't recall actually any other association or organization which has a legacy of 54 Nobel laureates and 31 head, heads of the state, which you have. Congratulations for that. And if you have that much of legacy, if you have that much of power, that much of light, that much of energy and enthusiasm and great minds, I am sure that the people sitting in this room have power to change the whole world, to make this world a better place for all of us. I came here this afternoon, and many of the friends, including Kim, was asking, could you take a little bit rest? My friend Anjali was giving me some hot water for my throat. And um, I'm not feeling tired being midst of you. But back home, I was informed that during last one year after the Nobel Prize, we have received over 18,000 invitations. And it will take me, they have made a rough calculation that it will take 92 years if I attend most of them. <laughs> so I have to live for another 92 years. Uh, when um, Albert Einstein got the Nobel Prize for his theory of relativity, he became very famous and he started getting many invitations and attending many meetings and conferences in universities and giving lectures. One day his driver found that he is getting tired. So driver suggested that I have an idea, sir, he said. What idea? He said, you look tired, but I have learned every single word, every single sentence, listening to you all the time. So next time when you are invited at a place where people did not see your photos, because those days they didn't have this uh, smartphone which Ambassador Young, you took out from your pocket. They were not, uh, these smartphones were not there, so most people have not seen his picture. He said that I can manage with you, you can sit in the back and let me deliver that lecture in place of you. So the new Einstein went on the dais and delivered a great speech. Everybody was thrilled and because uh, this man was not at least so tired. So he spoke every good thing. After a lot of applause, a professor stood up from the back and asked, sir, I have a question. He had a question. So this new Nobel uh, laureate, new uh, Einstein, listened the question carefully and told him, sir, I was hoping that you will ask a tough question, but it was such a simple, such a childish question. Even my driver who's sitting in the back can answer that question. <laughs> I'm not so lucky to have such a driver so far. 
But today when I asked, ask all of you, that what has enabled you to bring here? You can say your hard work, your great mind, your parents, your career. Good, it's true. But what is the most important factor which brought you over here and made you unable to do so, to become a Fulbright scholar or alumni? Two things, and they are so interconnected, like two sides of the same coin. One is freedom, and the second is education. If you're not given education, you can never become a Fulbright or any, anything in the life. If you're not given freedom, then you cannot even get education. So for the last 32 years, I have been advocating that freedom and education are two sides of same coin. We have to fight for both simultaneously. In a world where we, are, we have achieved so much, in technology, in IT, in so many spheres of life, there are millions of children who are not so fortunate. They are trapped into slavery. When I go to <coughs> Ivory Coast and talk to a group of children, and ask them, what is your dream? The children who are working day in and day out in producing cocoa beans, that is the core ingredient of chocolate. The child says, I have no dream. Then I asked, how do you like chocolate? He looked at me, what chocolate is? Chocolate is sweet candy bar. He looked at other spaces. He said, no, I have never heard of chocolate. I have never had chocolate. A child who lost his childhood and freedom and education and health and everything, producing something which is the core for production of chocolate, had no idea of chocolate. In Pakistan, when I talked to a group of children, What is your dream? A child says that the child who is working and is stitching footballs and each time when he stitch, there is a danger that the needle can go into his fingers and he suck his, suck his blood and kept on working in slavery. And he answered, I have no dream, sir. After insisting again and again, he says that if you, are give, if you give me a chance, I would like to hit a football, real football. I wanted to play with football one day. He stitches football, but he had no dream to play with one. There are 168 million children are working in full-time jobs. 85 million children are working in extreme forms of child labor. And millions are still enslaved, and some of them are born and grow up in slavery. They have no chance to education. Dear friends, after giving, giving up my career as an electrical engineer and teacher in the university, I started this campaign in 1981, when a desperate father came to my small office of a magazine which I was publishing for the cause of the most deprived children. And it was the time when child labor, child slavery, these things were non-issues in my country or anywhere in the world. People thought that slavery has been abolished in the 18th or 19th century. It was not the modern reality. This father told me that his daughter was about to be sold, 15-year-old daughter who was born and grew up in slavery at Brick Hill. The owner was selling her off to a brothel. When I was writing the story, I decided that it is not enough. If she was my daughter, if she was my sister, what would I do? I gave up my pencil and paper and, and decided to go and rescue. I went to that brick kiln, 
I collected some friends and some money, but we were beaten up, we were thrown away from the kills. This man, his name was Basal Khan, Muhammad Basal Khan, he was caught. His 15-year-old daughter could not be saved. I came back empty hands in Delhi, where I used to live. I spoke to some friends and finally, the, with the help of court, we succeeded in freeing 36 children, women and men. That was the first incident of freeing child slaves in India in 1981. But I realize that it is not an Indian problem, it's a national, national problem, it is a global problem. We organized a worldwide march across 103 countries in 1998 that gone for six months from three corners of the world with a demand that there should be an international law to combat slavery of children, trafficking, and worst forms of child labor. You will surprise to know that until 1989, there was no articulated concept of child rights in the world. Only in 1989, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child was adopted. Similarly, in 1999, 10 years after that, very recently, this law, international law against uh, worst forms of child labor was adopted by the ILO General Assembly. So we organized this march and that time 268 million children were in full-time jobs. And that was only in 2000. In 15 years, the number of child laborers in the world has decreased from those 268 million, 260 million to 168 million. Almost 100 million children were saved during these 15 years due to building a worldwide movement. And that's why I call the fight against child labor is a global civil rights movement. <laughs> the number of out of school children in 2000 was 130 million those days. But slowly, when the civil society geared up, I was one of the founders or co-founder and president of the Global Campaign for Education. The number has gone down from 130 million to 59 million, less than half. So these numbers, Jennifer said number matters. Number definitely matters. We have seen in 15 years' time, this number is decreasing. So I hate passivity and pessimism. I strongly believe that history is not created by those who just <coughs> criticize or clap from outside. History is written by those who had courage to jump in the ring without caring will they fail or succeed. We did it and it's possible. We made it possible. It's not me alone. Several people join hands. We must know that education is the most powerful enabler, most powerful equalizer, most powerful weapon or a tool to fight poverty and all sort of miseries. We who believe in the power of education perhaps are not so engaged or perhaps are not so devoted for this cause. We know the power of education. But there is other group, small number of people who know the power of education, they are feeling threatened. What happened in Pakistan about a year ago? When a group of handful of these terrorists attacked a school, why did they attack a school? Because they wanted to, they were feeling threatened by education and they wanted to create a situation of terror in schools so that the people should not send their children to school. 140 children were gunned down within few hours. 
I was talking to the group of mothers and fathers, and one of the mothers told that I sent my son to school in uniform, and he came back in coffin. Because these people feel threatened by education. What has happened in Kenya? More than 100 young people in the university was gunned down in, 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 in one night. In, two, in, in, in Nigeria, 200 girls were kidnapped, and half of them are not yet found, and nobody has, their, has an idea what is their fate. So these people know that if all children are educated, then the power of these terrorist outfits will be weakened. And I always say that when a child picks up a pencil, it weakens the power of millions of guns. And that's why we have to work hand in hand. There's no problem in the world which can be seen or solved in isolation. After 9-11, it's very clear that the world has to be united to fight out these forces. When it has been recognized scientifically that the world is in danger because of the global warming and ecological threats, we have to be united to solve it. When the economic slowdown comes and goes, then we have to think that no country can solve this problem. We have to work hand in hand. Dear friends, we live in a world of globalization. We have achieved a lot in globalizing markets and economies and products. We have achieved a lot in globalizing information and technology and data and digits. We are very fast in connecting with the world and each other through the high-speed jets. As I said, I came this, this afternoon and I'm leaving tomorrow morning and reach India. Hundreds of thousands of aeroplanes connect us every day. But dear sisters and brothers, young friends, what is missing in the world is the connect through compassion. You need not to borrow compassion from outside. I always say that compassion is a wealth, is a treasure which is inside each one of us. We are born with compassion. Let us try to convert that compassion into a social movement. And that is possible when we work for freedom and for education. We know that we cannot bring justice, economic justice, and social justice to the people, even gender justice in the poor countries or anywhere in the world without education. There is a latest report of the World Bank which proved that just one year of schooling for all children in a country will help in an increase of 0.34% annual GDP. Additional GDP would be increased if a country is educated for one year. If all people of that country is educated for 10 years, then there would be about 3.5% additional GDP growth. There is another report which proves that one year of schooling in the life of a person in childhood, in primary schooling, helps in an increase of 10% earning in the later stage. And one year of secondary schooling for the same child helps in 20% increase in income in the later stage. There are very hard facts. So when we talk of education, we are talking in economic terms also. When we talk of freedom, we talk of economic terms also. It is not only humanitarian issue, it's a major political as well as economic issue. Globally, 168 million children are in full-time jobs. As I said, on the other hand, 200 million adults are jobless. And who are these jobless adults? There are studies in Nigeria, in Kenya, in India, in Mexico, in Peru, in Philippines, which reveal that these unemployed adults are not, none 
but the very parents of child laborers. The children are preferred in jobs and denied education because they are cheap source of labor. And parents remain jobless because they are expensive workforce. So poverty, illiteracy, and child labor are interconnected. That makes a triangular paradigm. We have to break that cycle. We, have, we can break this cycle with collective efforts, with strong vision, with the strong courage, bold and innovative initiatives as a global community. We have to build the value of global citizenship. And that is possible. I am planning to launch the world's most ambitious and the largest campaign ever involving and engaging young people. Almost 100 million children are the victims of violence, slavery, trafficking, illiteracy, poverty, acute poverty, malnutrition, ill health, etc. 100 million, roughly. But on the other hand, 100 million plus young people and children in the schools are full with energy and enthusiasm, but also have a strong sense and element of idealism. They are hungry to do something. They are hungry to prove themselves to do something good. So my campaign would be 100 million for 100 million. Let the 100 million young people be given a better alternative to life to prove themselves to make this world a better place for other 100 million children. Let them give leadership because there is a hero inside every young person. We have to dig out that hero and that leader to make a better place for world's children. And finally, a uh, story of uh, uh, ancient uh, Indian uh, scripts remind me. It says that when uh, there was a uh, saintly man, a guru, who was living in jungle and teaching some bright people, only the brightest people, like full bright people. So the full bright, one of the full bright person came, not from you, an ancient age. He, he was a prince. So he came with some sort of ego. Uh, he was a prince after all. So he came and knocked the door of that person in jungle, that guru. And uh, from inside, this teacher asked, who are you? He said, I'm prince of your state. The teacher did not open the door. He said, I'm prince. He did not open the door. He did not listen. He said, who are you? He said, my name is XYZ, whatever his name. Two, three times, he did not open the door. The prince became very angry and went back. He was sitting and asking other people, and including his father. The father said, you must go back to this teacher. He is the great teacher. So he came back again. And this time, he was knocking the door. And teacher asked, who are you? Then after a while, this prince said, if I knew who am I, then why should I come to you? I didn't know who am I. Then the teacher opened the door, and he went in and studied for a few years. But when he was going back, and others were also going back in the convocation, teacher asked, who are you? He said, I am fire. I am spar. I wanted to enlighten the whole world. I will sacrifice myself, but make sure that no part in the world remain dark. I am fire. And then the teacher stood up and hugged all students and blessed them that you are fire. My dear friends, the Fulbright scholars, you are fire. You have to enlighten the whole world. You have to enlighten the whole world. And thank you and wish you the great success in your life. Thank you so much.
Thank you, thank you very much. There is a small token of our, our affection and our gratitude, which we hope you'll carry with you. And, uh, anyway, thank thank you. you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. You're very inspiring. Yeah. Thank you so much. I regret that why I did not come here early, 20 or 30 years ago, to be one of the... I could have applied for the Fulbright Scholarship. <laughs> but if I'm not late, I can do it now. So you can consider me as the part of the family. Thank you so much. <laughs>